Okay. This is the first time I've ever done this. So it's going to go into the Discord here. Do like an Archon tag. All the important people in the Discord. Okay. Let's see here. I want to see if there's a way. There's got to be a way to share this link, right? I already got a like. That's very interesting because I haven't done absolutely nothing. Um, ooh, that would easily find another device. Such a fucking boomer, man. I really don't. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, live right now. So bizarre, because I'm like watching myself do this. It's so cool though. What a time to be alive, you know? Okay. Put that up in the uh, Discord. All right, we're talking about Michelle's political parties. We're talking about um, part two, part one, I covered the introduction and I covered um, the first parts of uh, part one, leadership and democratic organizations. So this time I'm gonna try and cover like B and C. So basically we'll finish up part one of this book today. Um, but just to cover last time when we talked about, um, Michelle's basically lays out a case that uh, when you have a any kind of political organization, if your goal is democratic or egalitarian or whatever the case may be, um, there are inherently anti-democratic um, forces in the social structure that will compel your organization um, to adopt autocratic means. Um, and just for example, the chapter that we finished up on, which was chapter three of, uh, I guess, chapter three of part one of chapter one. This is a very, I don't like the way Michelle's organized this book at all. Um, it's actually really annoying, but he compares the uh, modern democratic or socialist party to a, um, a militarist fighting party in that whenever you're in a position where you're trying to seize power, you have to uh, take tactics into consideration. And that means, you know, uh, like on the battlefield, for example, the general's totally autocratic. You'll always have um, more efficiency in command when it's autocratic uh, rather than democratic. If you allow for democracy on the battlefield, you can get everyone killed. And so that's like one practical concern that drives oligarchy to take hold in democratic organizations. But there's all sorts of other things. The main one is that um, organization itself um, establishes um, a bureaucracy whereby people are put into their area of specialty. And according to their specialization, um, you create these little hierarchies of competence. There's all practical reasons why you do this. That's the power of organization is that you get to um, focus everyone's talents in the right direction because people aren't jacks of all trades. And so you need people who are good at bookkeeping. You need a people who are good at um, you know oratory and you need people who are good at leadership. And so you create a, a, a group of people who are specialists at leadership. And the more specialized they become, the better they become at it, the more they become indispensable. And they become entrenched in that position. And when you have people who are entrenched into leadership, um, eventually what happens is that position rigidifies um, as people try to hold on to their power. And eventually what you get is uh, divergent interests where the interests of the leadership and the interests of the party um, diverge. And as he points out, the leader is initially conceived of as a simply an organ, a, a, a functionary of the party. A just ex executing the will, the democratic will of the people. Um, but once the representative um, class takes on this new character, it inverts the position of the leaders in the Latin. They're no longer simply public servants, even though they may still use that language. Um, they truly become a separate um, class or caste of people. 
Yeah, I'm going through a cataclysmic winter storm right now. We actually don't have running water, but I have Topo Chico and I have tea that I made. We're uh, melting snow from the roof or letting collecting the melting snow from the roof, um, you know, to use for plumbing and stuff. It's great. It's wonderful. It's awesome. Um, all right. So, so the first thing that Michelle talks about in this next uh, chapter, um, he talks about uh, in the psychological causes of leadership, um, the, the first chapter is called the establishment of a customary right to the office of delegate. And he goes, he first talks about how resignation was often used by um, officials to actually solidify their power. So for example, um, during the troubled period of transition from absolute to constitutional monarchy during the ministry of Ludolf Kampenhausen, King Frederick Wilhelm IV of Prussia threatened to abdicate whenever liberal ideas were tending in Prussian politics to gain the upper hand over the romanticist conservatism which was dear to his heart. By this threat, the liberals are placed in a dilemma. Either they must accept the king's abdication, which would involve the accession to the throne of Prince William of Prussia, a man of ultra-reactionary tendencies, whose reign was likely to be initiated by an uprising among the lower classes, or else they must abandon their liberal schemes and maintain the power of the king uh, now become indispensable. Thus, Frederick Wilhelm always succeeded in getting his own way and in defeating the schemes of his political opponents. He also talks about how Bismarck did the same thing. Bismarck would often threaten to hand in his resignation. Um, and so it's a, it's a tried and true um, uh, technique, I suppose. And that's how he, he starts out basically, um, the reason why he brings this up is to bring bring up how the leaders, uh, the, the way that they establish an idea of having a customary right to office is through their indispensability. As they come to realize that they were so specialized under their role of leadership that the party um, is, has come to depend on them. And the way that they come into the knowledge of this power is when they threaten to resign. And oftentimes by that action um, are able to overcome popular resistance or the resistance of other members of the party. Um, and so that's mainly the thrust of chapter one. He's mainly what this section is about both B and C are really about um, the psychology um, like the first, well, everything we talked about last time was about um, the practical reasons why oligarchy takes hold in democratic structures. What we're talking about now is the psychological reasons, both why on the part of the leaders and on the part of the the party itself, the masses within the party, both uh, why the masses feel a need to have leadership and why the leaders feel that they need to be the leaders and stay in power. Um, let's see here. So chapter two is called the need for leadership felt by the mass and, uh, picked out a couple quotes here on page 85, um, beginning of the section. Um, there is no exaggeration in the assertion that among the citizens who enjoy political rights, the number of those who have a lively, lively interest in public affairs is insignificant. In the majority of human beings, the sense of an intimate relationship between the good of the individual and the good of the collectivity is but little developed. Most people are altogether devoid of understanding of the actions and reactions between that organism we call the state and their private interests, their prosperity and their life. Um, as de Tocqueville expresses it, they regard it as far more important to consider whether it is worthwhile to put a road through their land than to interest themselves in the general work of public administration. And I guess I'll go on quoting because he brings up Sterner and we all love Max Sterner. So uh, the majority is content with Sterner to call out to the state, quote, get away from between me and the sun, which is, uh, of course, what Diogenes says to Alexander. This is one request of Alexander is to um, a man who could this ruler who could conceivably bring him anything. So a representative of the state, the, the powerful head of state offers him anything. And Diogenes says, get out of my sunlight. The only thing you can do is, is get, get away from between me and the what is already given to me by nature. Um, and so Michelle's is saying that's the general psychology of a lot of uh, the rank and file of party politics or of just people in general. Even, even people who have been made part of the franchise, which most people have not. 
Um, it is, I mean, and I don't know, maybe this is like a tr trite or, um, um, I don't know, obvious point, but it is, it is just interesting how many people out of just apathy or out of like to make a point or because they have some ideology, um, having been given the franchise, having been given the ability to elect their, um, their leaders, like consciously opt out of it or just don't, don't care at all. Um, you know, again, just something that's like very unusual in the history of mankind that such a large number of people have been afforded, um, this, 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 uh, engagement, this meaningful civil act, civic act, and most can't be bothered to even, um, show up at the polling place. Um, and so this is, that's sort of what he's talking about here. Um, but he's, there's something. So what the, the chapter again is called the need for leadership felt among the masses, right? So there's sort of another constituent part of that. It's not when people are disinterested in uh, having a say in the rulership of the society and, and turning the levers of power one way or the other, what does that imply? It implies they want someone else to do it and they would prefer that someone else be the leader. Um, so he says on page 86, in the life of modern democratic parties, we may observe signs of similar indifference. It is only a minority which participates in party decisions. Sometimes that minority is ludicrous, ludicrously small. The most important resolutions taken by the most democratic of all parties, the Socialist Party, always emanate from a handful of the members. It is true that the renouncement of the exercise of democratic rights is voluntary, except in those cases which are common enough where the active participation of the or organized mass in party life is prevented by geographical or topographical conditions. Speaking generally, is the urban part of the organization which decides everything? The duties of the members living in the country districts and remotely provincial towns are greatly restricted. They are expected to pay their subscriptions and to vote during elections in favor of candidates selected by the organization of the great town. Um, so, a little further down the page. The majority of the members are as indifferent to the organization as the majority of electors are to the parliament. That's just as true today, just as true today. Even in countries like France, where the collective political education is of older date, the majority renounces all active participation in tactical and administrative questions, leaving these to the little group which makes a practice of attending meetings. Um, basically, the, it's another major premise that he's identified here, that there's, there's a social force within the masses, a drive within them to push up um, leaders um, that is driven by their their desire to cast off responsibility from for um, for the political project from themselves. They, they don't have an interest in it. And there's real practical reasons why this is, because for one, if you're a working class person, you have a lot of demands on you, on your time. You have, might have a family to feed. And, and first and foremost, you have to work, um, which takes up hours of every day. Um, and so the interest of the masses has always been towards usually just quotidian survival, but, um, you know, or, or the pursuit of education or their own ends, which again, that's why he, part of why he brings up Sterner here is that it, it, it is, you could argue this is like an element of, of capitalist society and, and maybe it is, or of liberal society more generally that we're all a part of, that we're all concerned with our own individual ends. We all have our own little, little projects um, that we're focused on that are more important than the collective project. Um, and that's, that's a, that's going to be as common of people in the working class, probably more so because, um, the, you know, they, they don't, without things like a college education or liberal education, unless you like serve in the military, you're not going to be inculcated into these abstract values. You, to the extent that you, you see the state as this protector of your, stability that's, you know, allowing for the, the market to exist. But, um, you know, I, I guess, I guess what I'm saying, it's more common after you've, if you're a person of higher education to have this abstract higher calling, so to speak. Let's see if anyone's asking anything on discord. No. Let's see Kohei in there. He says I should live stream music. I have live stream music, but I'm not doing that today. Um, okay. So this is another example he brings up on page 87. I'll just read this whole paragraph. Um, 
and he's not really talking about party politics here. He's just sort of talking about like in, in those days, you know, the little, the town hall meeting or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, little, small local community meetings. It may be added that the regular attendance at public meetings and committees are by no means always proletarians, especially where the smaller centers are concerned. When his work is finished, the proletarian can think only of rest and of going to bed in good time. His place at meetings is taken by petty bourgeois, by those who come to sell newspapers and picture postcards, by clerks, by young intellectuals who have not yet got a position in their own circle, people who are all glad to hear themselves spoken of as authentic proletarians and to be glorified as the class of the future. As we go on, I'm just going to keep throwing it out there. Does any of this sound familiar to modern day American politics? Um, because that is very familiar to me. That's the, the, um, the professional class of today, the, the, the intellectual laborers, um, most of whom are very precarious as we all are, but, um, the, the notion that they're working class, it's at least questionable, but whether or not they are, they know that they're, there's, that it's questionable, right? And they would like to be, hear themselves spoken of as authentic proletarians. We, we hear this even now in like online socialist discourse of people who want to, um, they want to identify themselves as working class because ultimately that's a question of, I'm a good person. It's that's what it's really about. Um, that being identified with a working class, it's, it's a moral uh, evaluation rather than like a material reality pushing you to struggle. Um, he says further down, the same thing happens in, as in party life as happens in the state. In both, the demand for monetary supplies is upon a coercive foundation, but the electoral system has no established sanction. An electoral right exists, but no electoral duty. Until this duty is superimposed upon the right, it appears probable that a small minority only will continue to avail itself of the right which the majority voluntarily renounces, and the minority will always dictate laws for the indifferent and apathetic mass. Uh, the consequence is that in the political groupings of democracy, the participation in party life has an echelon aspect. So multiple echelons of um, influence or power within the party structure. Um, and that's mostly just going to be um, based on, you know, uh, how much they participate. It, I mean, okay, as we get into this book further, you will see that there's other forces, um, you know, like nepotism will come into play or um, the people who become entrenched as leaders start to create a clique and a cult of personality around themselves and want to select their own successors. So that all happens. But um, in the bureaucratic meritocracy, to some extent, um, the amount of legwork you're um, able to put in, you can, um, that's, that's how much influence you're going to have, um, at least during the, this day, these days of party politics, um, which remember in time Michelle's writing is 19, um, early 1900s, late 1800s. Um, oh, and I thought this was a great quote on page 88. Though it grumbles occasionally, the majority is really delighted to find persons who will take the trouble to look after its affairs. Um, this need is accompanied by a genuine cult for the leaders who are regarded as heroes. Mycenism, the rock upon which so many serious reforms have at all times been wrecked, is at present increasing rather than de decreasing. So Mycenism, that's, you know, the adversity to change, basically. That there's a, uh, the oligarchical tendency, when it, the, he's pointing out all these factors that lead to oligarchy rigidifying in democracies. And the oligarchical tendency has um, Mycenism on its side, the, uh, the, just the, the default status quo bias, wanting stability, wanting, um, being untrustworthy of things that because because it's an unproven claim that the new leadership um, can do a good job and even if the current leaders are doing a subpar job what if the new leaders are disastrous and that this is an inherently conservative tendency is what it is uh, he says to this mycenism are super added and more particularly in the popular parties profound differences of culture and education among the members these differences give to the need for leadership felt by the masses a continually increasing dynamic tendency. Again, so that's the divergent interests of the party leadership 
and the rank and file of the party. And I kind of glossed over it last time. I, I may have read a quote that made reference to it, but he talks a lot of in this book how a lot of the parties began to um, set up their own schools for the education of socialist um, leadership, basically. Um, I mean, it, it was it was for individual like professional domains. So, you know, you would go to, you, I mean, basically in the trade unions or in the socialist parties or socialist societies, whatever they, they may be, if you wanted to uh, move up in the, the ranks of the party, they would either pay for you to go to get schooling somewhere in an existing institution or set up their own schools where you could learn things like bookkeeping and finance and um, manage, management, whatever the case may be, oratory. You would read all these um, socialist writers as well. But that creates um, a difference um, in the culture and education um, and therefore a difference in the 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 tastes and the interests and the desires of the, the leaders and the lead, uh, once again. Um, let's see here. Um, <laughs> it's also funny. He, he talks about how the crowd can, can uh, often abandon leaders just out of sheer apathy. Um, this is kind of just incidental to his point, but it's, it's kind of funny. He just talks about m numerous times where it was like, uh, what is it? The millions of leaflets were distributed, um, Within the space of a few days, 150 meeting, meetings of protest were held, always without effect. There was no genuine agitation. Um, that's like in Saxony in 1895. Um, when it was, it was a proposal to restrict the suffrage of thousands of workers, and the socialist leaders couldn't like arouse them to any genuine agitation. Um, what else? Um, well, and, and so that that said, Michel's is not a reactionary, so he rejects the. Um, the agitator theory of political movements, of socialist political movements. Um, so he says that uh, it's, it's, a, it's a move, it's an opinion favored by certain narrow-minded conservatives um, that popular movements are artificial products, the work of isolated individuals termed agitators. Um, in collective movements, with rare exceptions, the process is natural and not artificial. Natural above all is the movement itself at whose head the leader takes his place, not as a rule of his own initiative, but by force of circumstances. That's all true. Um, the movement exists, the party exists before the leader steps into this role, typically. Um, I mean, certainly now, socialism has been going on for like 150 years, maybe maybe more if you consider France. You know, find socialism in a lot of ways. But I'll read from him here. The need which the mass feels for guidance and its incapacity for acting in default of an initiative from without and from above impose, however, heavy burdens upon the chiefs. The leaders of modern democratic parties do not lead an idle life. Our positions are anything but sinecures, and they have acquired their supremacy at the cost of extremely hard work. Their life is one of incessant effort. The tenacious, persistent, and indefatigable agitation characteristic of the Socialist Party, particularly in Germany, never relaxed in consequence of causal failures, nor ever abandoned because of causal successes, in which no other party has yet succeeded in imitating, has justly aroused the admiration even of critics and of bourgeois opponents. In democratic organizations, the activity of the professional leader is extremely fatiguing, often destructive to health, and in general, highly complex. He has to continually to sacrifice his own vitality in the struggle, and when, for reasons of health, he ought to slacken his activities, he is not free to do so. The claims upon him never wane. The crowd has an incurable passion for distinguished orators from men of great name, and if these are not obtainable, they insist at least upon an MP. At anniversaries and other celebrations of which the democratic masses are so fond, and always during electoral meetings, demands pour into the central organization and close always on the same note. We must have an MP. Um, and so what he's talking about here, um, th there is an incredible demand on the leaders, an incredible demand for the leaders. Um, it, 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 what he by stressing how like it, that's what I love about this book so much. Uh, it's, it's all about the the practical, um, the ideal meets practical, and the practical limitations and contradictions and pushback to all of our idealism. And um, he's very rarely just um, 
you know, shitting on people or saying like, you're, Oh, like all the leaders are, they were just counter revolutionary or whatever, or just saying they were bad people or whatever the case may be. He's just, um, he's saying, look, they actually do. These people work their asses off incredibly hard job to run these underdog parties fighting in these parliamentary systems, um, fighting against all these, you know, monarchist inclinations, reactionaries, and so on. Like in Germany, a lot of why this is really remarkable is, uh, when he's talking about the German Socialist Party is because they they had such um, staunch opposition from the state and from, um, you know, all the major um, social economic powers. But <laughs> that's all the more reason why the average party man doesn't want to do it. Um, why there's only a certain personality type that is suitable to um, attain the leadership role. There that, um, you know, I'm sure we're all familiar with the Pareto distribution at this point from uh, old JBB. But, uh, <laughs> you know, there's that 1% of people who do 90% of the tasks. And it's like, that's the time and stress and energy demand on you in political life. And that's true today. Um, as well in all party politics. Okay. Um, chapter three, political gratitude of the masses. Um, and it's pretty self-explained. This is all of chapter three. You can see chapter four starts in the next slide. Um, it's the, the, it's the reality that that hard work does earn a genuine sense of gratitude and that that makes people feel that the leader is entitled to their position. Chapter four, the cult of veneration among the, ma the masses. Um, I'm just going to read a passage from, from, from this chapter because I think it says it all um, about, and uh, actually before reading it, I guess I would just say what's interesting, um, in a very peculiar thing in Europe that very few people talk about. Um, I've written a couple medium articles on this. It's going to be like a three part series and two of the three parts are done. i um, talking about um, like Protestant Christianity and like this urge to religious secessionism and uh, how a lot of these really bizarre Christian sects, um, they had all these idiosyncratic beliefs and they're constantly, um, I, it, it created this ground, this fertile ground where anything could emerge. Um, so What's peculiar is a lot of the first experiments in what you would call like socialism in Europe actually came from Protestant, um, like breakaway sects. And the big one would be like the Anabaptists, um, where they, um, the radical Anabaptists anyway, believed in sharing all property in common. Um, also in polygamy, because if your wife is your property um, and isn't a full person under the law, that's just another object you have, well, then you should share your wife. Um, so whatever you, we may think about that for modern terms, um, that was sort of like, they're not Marxist socialists, obviously, right? But they were, they were challenging the idea of privately held property and of property rights by inheritance and political uh, ownership of political power by inheritance, and that all this should be shared in common. Now, what happened in practice is what usually happens with these cults that preach that, um, because it's another, it's another sort of, um, uh, social structural force, similar to what Michelle's is identifying here. And when all property is remanded into the care of the state, because you can't just give it to everyone. Um, you have to have some sort of, uh, Leviathan to enforce that law, that there's no private property. It's the thing that you're banning and that you've made a law against and the law is only, um, important so long as you have um, some sort of body to enforce that law. So uh, what always happened is that the leader just took all the property for themselves because they were effectively, the cult leader is the effective head of state. Um, it, and so they weren't successful, but they had this notion that um, in accordance with the gospel of Jesus the um, all pro there should be no private property. All of it should be shared in common. And you could get that reading from the Gospels um, in terms of I mean, all of this has kind of been bandied about the the modern left wing. Um, 
I think rather cynically. I think a lot of the modern left, it's very obvious uh, we're a secular, very atheistic bunch. And so it's more just trying to be play gotcha with Christians. But um, in any case, uh, we all know the passages these days that Jesus, you know, advocated that rich people, it's harder for a camel to be threaded through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, take, take no, take no thought for the morrow. Don't, you know, don't like hoard your wealth and plan for the future. The Lord will take care of you. Um, and, you know, he lived among the bums and the downtrodden and the whores and all that. And so when these, uh, when the Bible was translated in the vernacular, a lot of people saw that. And, and these early Protestant movements were sort of like, they were Christian socialism is, is what I'm, what I'm saying. And though that dream didn't work out just like in regular socialism, it's interesting to me, this long precedes Marx or um, I mean, we're talking in like 1500s is when the, the Anabaptist um, like the siege, siege of uh, uh, Munster, I believe, I believe it was Dan Carlin has an episode about it. In hardcore history. Uh, excuse me. Uh, that's what this topo will do to you. So anyway, I'm going to read this passage with that in mind, Christian socialism. Um, and I'm not saying this is influenced by the old Christians, like the Anabaptists. I'm just saying there's a, how do I put this? There's a psychological relationship there between, um, like there are people like Nietzsche who have identified in modern day socialism. They've said that is um, laundered the values of Christianity in a secular form. Okay. So now the passage from Michelle's page 94 in Sicily in 1892, when the first agricultural laborers unions known as Fasci, Fasci, it's the plural of, it's refers, that refers to the ceremonial axes that the lictors would carry around. Um, you know, uh, the, the lictors were like the, the sort of like royal ceremonial guard of um, like a Caesar or a, um, a dictator or a consul, even I believe, and even in Republican Rome, they would have had lictors. Um, so the, the the fasci, they call themselves fasci, and that is the root word of fascism. So, um, just interesting. This is like a time predating, I guess, where any distinction between the two. You just had these workers' movements. Um, I guess you know it's it's the difference between um, international communism and national communism. So in Sicily in 1892, when the first agricultural laborers unions, laborers unions known as Fasci were constituted, the members had an almost supernatural faith in their leaders. In an ingenious confusion of the social question with their religious practices, they often in their processions carried the crucifix side by side with the red flag and with placards inscribed with sentences from the works of Marx. The leaders were escorted on their way to the meetings with music, torches, and Japanese lanterns, many drunk with the sentiment of adoration prostrated themselves before their leaders, as in former days they had prostrated themselves before their bishops. A bourgeois journalist once asked an old peasant, member of the socialist Fascio, if the proletarians did not think that Giuseppe de Felice, Giuffrida de uh, Garibaldi de Bosco, that's my best pronunciation there, and the other young students or lawyers who, though of bourgeois origin, were working on behalf of the Fasci, were not really doing this with the sole aim of securing their own election as county councillors and deputies. De Felice and Bosco are angels come down from heaven, was the peasant's brief and eloquent reply. Um, and so in this chapter called Cult of Veneration Among the Masses, I'm gonna take my hair down. I'm, I haven't, like, there's no running water, so I haven't showered in a couple days. So if I keep doing these vlogs, knocking them out as I, I'm at home, I might not release them all. I might like get a backlog, but my hair is going to look worse and worse. I'm just going to generally look worse and worse. Things are going to look worse and worse around here. I'm also in like the shittiest room because it's the most soundproof. And uh, me and my wife are at home all the time because all the roads are frozen. There's nowhere to go. Um, pandemic and winter, winter Holocaust. Okay. Um, it's not a Holocaust. Um, <laughs> okay. So cult of veneration among the masses they have, he's pointing out, again, this is on the psychological causes of, of oligarchy taking hold of democracy. 
Um, so we already have seen the practical reasons why a lot of people want to shunt off that responsibility from the masses into a leader figure. Well, here we're seeing that like transmuted psychologically into the religious sphere. Um, and, and with good reason, because there is a, um, some sort of, uh, there's like a, a, a connection, a, the same moral thread that the um, Christians and the Anabaptists, the Christian socialists and the Marxist socialists are um, grabbing hold of or perceiving. Um, he says the adoration of the chiefs survives their death. Um, it, he, he points out how, yeah, this is a good, another good example. After the death of LaSalle, uh, the Algenminer Deutscher Arbeiterverein, of which he had been the absolute monarch, um, so that's his party, and he's referring to him as an absolute monarch, kind of cheekily, but really, yeah, he, he did wield that much influence. Um, it broke up into two sections. The fraction of Countess Hotsfield, or female line, as the Marxist adversary sarcastically called it, and the male line, led by J.B. von Schweitzer. While quarreling fiercely with one another, these two groups are at one, not only in respect of the honor they paid to LaSalle's memory, but also in their faithful observance of every letter of his program. So it, it, it's very much resembling the line of transmission of a, of a, a lineal um, heritable dynasty, a, 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 a heritable political power, which again, always go back to the introduction, aristocratic democracy, democratic aristocracy, the line between them that he is blurring throughout the, the text. Um, the masses experience a profound need to prostrate themselves, not simply before great ideals, but also before the individuals who in their eyes incorporate such ideals. Um, that's on page 96. A little further down, he says, um, Bernard Shaw, who defines democracy as a collection of idolaters, uh, in contradistinction to aristocracy, which is a collection of idols. Um, and the object of such adoration, megalomania is apt to uh, ensue. And I can't help but think of um, like charismatic preachers or um, gurus or self-help figures or um, uh, people of that nature. Like there's a great documentary called uh, Kumare where um, Vikram Gandhi, the filmmaker, um, creates this fictitious persona of a guru and he goes to uh, Arizona and he gathers followers and it's it's tongue in cheek because he tells them his message is that he's not a guru. So he was actually being honest with them. Um, and, but a lot of gurus say things like that. Like Osho said, I'm, Oh, I'm nothing special. Um, the guru always says that that's like the whole pretense of the Zen masters is, Oh, we're just ordinary people. We've recognized the ordinary mind of the Buddha nature. Um, but so he had, he, he, he did do things that we like taught them like the special meditation, everything that was all completely made up. And then he, um, he, he eventually like, I mean, it's, it's a great documentary. You should watch it. The point is at one point in the documentary, um, he's leading them in what he calls the blue light meditation. And he says, and this was the first time I actually saw the blue light, like project out of my head, which is what he was telling them to visualize. And I felt all of these emotions that were all completely pulled out of the ether. I'm going to play a way of saying, pull it out of his ass. Um, he just made all this up, but he felt it. And when you look into people like Ellen Ron Hubbard, or um, you look into like, uh, who else would be a good example? Uh, like, it's it's hard to say who's like a true, I mean, Osho is probably another good example as well. Um, it, it's hard to say who's like a true huckster and who's a true believer um, in the first place. But even, even where you can find ones who are truly hucksters, the line starts to blur for them a little bit. Because once you're just psychologically, you're getting all this adoration and gratitude from people. Um, it's just another, it's another argument or another factor he's pointing out of a, of a social psychological reality that as you receive this adoration, even if there are democratic norms that are supposed to limit your power and make you accountable to the people, um, you will start to perceive yourself as the, the hero, the divine hero, and they will, the masses will start to hero worship as well. Um, Emerald says, I look like Thomas Hobbes. It's in Discord. It's not in the YouTube live chat. So if you're watching this video later, you won't see that. Um, it's interesting. I look like Thomas Hobbes. He's probably my favorite. I guess I do right now. I, I don't know if you're on the stream and I was explaining, I haven't showered in a couple of days. 
Um, so there's no water currently in Texas um, for a lot of people anyway. Yeah, he's my favorite of the uh, social contract. You know, the typical three people mention of um, like Rousseau, Hobbes, and Locke. Uh, very much like Hobbes. So we'll move on to chapter five. Um, we're still on part B, but C only consists of one section. So um, I think we're coming to the end. I'm going to try and keep all these at an hour. Um, it's called Accessory qual Qualities Requisite uh, to Leadership. Um, he, he basically gives the... Michelle's here is, is, is trying to take account of what he thinks will lead people to um, naturally become... What, what, it, what is required of leadership within the democratic oligarchic structure. Um, number one is oratory. He says on page 99, the prestige acquired by the orator in the minds of the crowd is almost unlimited. What the masses appreciate above all are oratorical gifts as such. Beauty and strength of voice, suppleness of mind, badinage. Whilst the contents of the speech is of quite secondary importance. A spouter who, as if bitten by a tarantula, rushes hither and thither to speak to the people is apt to be regarded as a zealous and active comrade. Whereas one who, speaking little but working much, does valuable service for the party, is regarded with disdain and considered but an incomplete socialist. Which, I mean, so a lot of the observations that he, he draws here, you know, I, I'm glossing over a lot of where he he gives a general principle, like of like going into the nitty gritty of, of all the examples he raises, but some things like that are just psychological observations that could have come from like Ru La Rochefoucauld, um, or, or, or Nietzsche for that matter. Um, but that are very hard in the same way of like a Nietzschean aphorism, very hard to deny, um, in common practice. Cause we all know people, even in our own workplace, if you've ever, um, you know, worked a job of the person who can talk themselves up, um, while doing comparably little work, um, and get more recognition than, than someone else who's more, more, uh, reserved. Um, the other qualities he gives that, that, that produce leaders in democratic systems, um, he says force of will, um, as he elaborates on that, uh, a Catonian strength of conviction, a force of ideas often verging on fanaticism. Again, reminding me of charismatic preachers because um, it's really the confidence with which you, that you project and the conviction with which you say things. It's a dramatic performance. Um, it has absolutely no bearing on whether or not somebody should be believed. Um, but like that, it, it's just a reality to grapple with that, um, when dealing with especially crowds, when you have a speaker that speaks with conviction, it's almost the degree to which they can, um, be resolute in their conviction that they are impressive and persuasive to the crowd. Um, it's not, you know, based on how logical they are. Um, and that's, that's a quality that a lot of charismatics have. Um, the, the ability to say things with absolute sincerity. And sometimes uh, those people are now known to us to be frauds. Like uh, Peter Popoff, Peter, uh, not Popoff. Yeah, Popoff, Peter Popoff, for example. Um, great charismatic preacher. Um, hilarious, hilarious content. Faith healer type stuff. Um, but a scammer. Um... But okay, the the uh, he doesn't number these. I've just kind of numbered these of what he says. The, the third one that he says, which we're calling the Christian socialism thing, he says, in exceptional cases, finally goodness of the heart and disinterestedness, qualities which recall in the minds of the crowd the figure of Christ, and reawaken religious sentiments which are decayed but not extinct. Pretty self-explanatory. But number four, the quality, however, which most of all impresses the crowd is the prestige of celebrity. Um, and he quotes uh, Tard. Uh, Actually, when a mind acts upon our own thought, it is with the collaboration of many other minds through whom we see it, and whose opinion without our knowledge is reflected in our own. We muse vaguely on the esteem shown him, on the admiration he, expired, and he in inspires. 
excuse me. If he is a famous man, the number of his admirers impresses us confusedly en masse. And this influence takes on an air of objective solidarity, of impersonal reality, creating the prestige proper for great figures. Um, so what he's saying is the, the, um, uh, the, the, so the figure of celebrity um, becomes a, a, a vessel into which we um, pour all of our, uh, he's, he's like an avatar, an icon of our solidarity. And when we get into, I'm not going to cover it this time, but a later chapter called Bonapartism, that's um, essentially his uh, Hobbes's, or not Hobbes's, sorry, I'm reading, I just see Emerald posted here, he says, I bet you love Thomas Hobbes because he was an absolutist. It's actually not true. Um, <laughs> but we'll, it's a subject for another stream. Um, but Michel's, he's saying, uh, quoting, quoting Tard. Here, I'll just read what his comment is. It's a point of honor with the masses to put the conduct of their affairs in the hands of a celebrity. The crowd always submits willingly to the control of distinguished individuals. Um, the man who appears before them crowned with laurels is considered a priority to be a demigod. demigod. Um, Trump, maybe? I don't know. I, I just say that because I, I know it's like a cliche to even bring him up, but um, like the, that's probably the best example of like the power of celebrity. But we all know, like, I, I, I'm going to continually just like in little, little bits apply Michelle's to modern like American politics as we go. And that's another aspect of especially like um, primary politics and national politics where s name recognition is like the single best determinant of like how well a candidate's going to do. Um, just whether people know their name at all. That's, I mean, and that's literally just a, that's a, that's a measure of how famous they are. Um, now polls, after 2020, I'm not going to believe any poll. And I always say that. And I always go back to like, even if I have my reservations, you still see it. And you're like, Ooh, like if you see a poll that like fits your um, um, preconceptions or, or has an outcome that you, uh, I don't know that you find uh, favorable or, or it, it's, it's, it's the, it's the effect Jonathan Haidt talks about when um, people, people who uh, can like evaluate like of, of uh, not just confirmation bias, but um, being able to successfully ignore the things that you um, don't fit with your worldview. And um, like he talks about, if you see a scientific study, for example, that says that um, ca drinking caffeine uh, can be harmful to pregnant women. He says that uh, like the number one group of people who can find things wrong with that study when they do psychological experiments is pregnant women who like to drink coffee. Like, so they'll find everything wrong with that study um, because it goes against um, their interests. Um, I don't know. It's measurable psychological effect, but don't know the name of it. And I'm probably just should move on. So chapter six, accessory peculiarities of the masses. Um, this is the last chapter in part B, uh, and then we'll cover the one chapter in C and be done. So we'll probably be coming in right under the hour and I'll probably just, have time to do answer a couple of questions at the end if Emerald or anyone else is still here. Thank you for coming, by the way. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm just going to keep doing these regardless. I don't know if I'll do all of them live, but I'm kind of uh, helping to like process my own thoughts on Michelle's while I'm doing this. So in chapter six, he says, to enable us to understand and properly appreciate the superiority of the leaders over the mass, it is necessary to turn our attention to the characteristics of the rank and file. Question arises, what are these masses? It has already been shown that a general sentiment of indifference towards the management of its own affairs is natural to the crowd, even when organized to form political parties. Um, so that's mostly what we've been talking about up to this point. Uh, we've covered it in this, this uh, section. Mm -hmm. But he starts to talk about um, other just like practical realities as to why that is, as to why the mass is not, um, as a collective, an effective force. Um, why this is like, it's the paradox why he says in the other sections we covered last time that democracy has a parabolic course that you have, um, you have 
the party must organize, the people must organize in order to be an effective force, in order to be powerful and exercise power. Um, but in doing so, in organizing, they have to they have to create leadership. And then that creates this echelon effect and the stratification. And so the necessity of organizing um, produces these entrenched leadership um, positions. But so what the reasons why within the structure of the party, so that the, I guess my reason for bringing that up and reiterating that is that the, it's not that the people can't effectively organize to achieve their ends. They can do that within the, the party structure. The problem is, um, or rather the party structure can become an effective, powerful force, but to what ends they, they work is going to be the ends of the leadership. And that becomes a problem when the leadership's ends diverge from the membership of the party. And so why doesn't the membership of the party within the party, having already organized, exercise effective control? Um, because we have plenty of people who um, are completely apathetic, but presumably there would be some number of people who have an activist mindset who are going to be involved. That's going to be an outsized number of them in party party politics, right? Um, so here's one reason why they're hampered in this on page 105. The very composition of the mass is such as to render it unable to resist the power of an order of leaders aware of its own strength. An analysis of the German trade unions in respect to the age of the members gives a sufficiently faithful picture of the cosmo or sorry, of the composition also of the various socialist parties. The great majority of the membership ranges in, ranges in age from 25 to 39 years. Quite young men find other ways of employing their leisure. They are heedless, their thoughts run in erotic channels, they're always hoping that some miracle will, will deliver them from the need of passing their whole lives as simple wage earners. And for the, these reasons, they are slow to join a trade union. Probably generally true. I mean, when I was much younger, I I was not thinking about like workplace organizing because I was thinking I'm never going to have to, I'm not going to spend my life like as a wage earner in the workplace. I'm going to get famous doing music or whatever. Um, so when you're really young, you, 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 you don't... You, it's just, I mean, it's almost a truism. You're not planning for the future in the same way. Uh, the men over 40, weary and disillusioned, commonly resign their membership unless retained in the union by purely personal interest, to secure out-of-work pay, insurance against illness, and the like. Consequently, there is lacking in the organization the force of control of ardent and irreverent youth and also that of experienced maturity. In other words, the leaders have to do with a mass of members to whom they are superior in respect of age and experience of life, whilst they have nothing to, to fear from the relentless criticism, which is so peculiarly characteristic of men who have just attained virility. So, you know, think what you will of that. He says, you know, from 25 to 39 is kind of like, they don't have the wisdom of age yet, and they're not, they don't have like the fire of youth quite anymore. Um, you know, as somebody who's 31, um, yeah, I guess that's true. I don't know. What am I doing? I mean, I guess what 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 am I gonna do besides stay inside during a snowstorm? Okay. Okay, and so just one point to sort of wrap this up. He ties it together very nicely here. Hence, the leaders, when compared with the masses, whose composition varies from moment to moment, constitute a more stable and more constant element of the organized membership. And it, what he points out here is that um, most people. The vast majority um, are not uh, staying in the party for more than uh, a couple of years. They have the, the majority of the members spend, you know, two, three years of active membership, maybe three or four. It starkly declines once you get into, um, you know, five, six years, six, seven years. And then there's a bulk of people who have been there more than eight who are just like the careerists. Um, I guess maybe I can just like hold this up so you can see. I don't know if that'll. But he's basically showing that the um, there's there's a lot of turnover. Um, most people do not um, stay in the socialist party for their whole lives, and the ones that do are a minority. And those are the people who who gain a career interest in in continuing with the party. So finally, we're going to talk about intellectual factors which is part C, and that's one single chapter called Superiority of the Professional Leaders in Respect to Culture, 
and their indispensability, the formal and real incompetence of the mass. Now, for a socialist, Michel's really um, likes to talk shit about the mass. He's very, very Nietzschean in that respect. Um, even though he doesn't, he barely mentions Nietzsche. Um, okay. This is page 107. With the appearance of professional leadership, there ensues a great accentuation of the cultural differences between the leaders and the led. Long experience has shown that among the factors which secure the dominion of minorities over majorities, money and its equivalents, tradition and hereditary transmission, the first place must be given to the formal instruction of the leaders, so-called intellectual superiority. Now the most superficial observation shows that in the parties of the proletariat, the leaders are, in matters of education, greatly superior to the lead. See it again, it's divergent interests. It's divergent interests because there's a divergent culture. Um, they have to become, the leaders have to become more educated in order to become effective. Um, so it's a practical reality. It's not because of evil or corruption, but eventually they become um, distinct from the party rank and file. Um, he gives a lot of examples of this. He says on page 111, the democratic masses are thus compelled to submit to a restriction of their own wills, and they are forced to give their leaders an authority which is in the long run destructive to the very principle of democracy. The leader's principal source of power is found in his ind indispensability. One who is indispensable has in his power all the lords and masters of the earth. Um, that's just sort of a continual... Uh, another recapitulation of the idea that we've elaborated on that by becoming um, so it's, it's, it's like a perverse outcome of, of your delegates doing exactly what you want them to do. If you, if you have a, a party leader, someone that you have elected to represent the people who is an excellent debater and is great at, let's say they're in parliament and they're getting your, your, you know, um, measures passed on behalf of the workers, that person becomes um, valuable to you. But then that creates this this um, um, this natural inclination that you know. Suppose there's some sort of challenge to that person's power. Suppose you find that they are um, corrupt from some way in some way. Maybe they're embezzling from the organization or something, and you know, or maybe they're just uh, behaving in an increasingly autocratic manner whatever the case may be, um, you will be hesitant to challenge them because of the tactical advantage you might lose by losing that person. Um, let's see here. From the democratic point of view, this is perhaps an evil, but it is a necessary evil. Socialism does not signify everything by the people, but everything for the people. Consequently, the English socialists entrust the salvation of democracy solely to the goodwill and to the insight of the leaders. Um, yeah, he talks a little bit about the English socialists, um, uh, not to be confused with Ingsoc of Orwell, Orwellian uh, Ingsoc, which obviously that wasn't written yet. But, um, you, you know, yet again, we're, we're, we're blurring the lines between aristocracy and democracy because the leader that is accepted where you accept his goodwill and his moral purity as a, as by a as an article of faith where you have a um you've put your trust in the leader um beyond any sort of like um you know uh, which is which is sort of i mean that's what you're doing anytime you delegate responsibility right when you um have like the i think he says later in the book um the the duties that the um, or any, any, any accountability or authority that the electors have over the elected ends the moment the election is certified. So once you have voted them into power, you have, um, on, based on trust or faith, um, that they're going to do the right thing, ceded your power and responsibility to the elected representative. Yet again, why Rousseau said that representative democracy is not true democracy, that only true democracy is direct democracy. Um, and, so that's like, it's a common, he doesn't really get into Rousseau much in these sections we covered today, but um, even when he doesn't bring up Rousseau by name, I see the the influence of Rousseau um, speaking through Michelle's. I'll just, co I'll cover one last reading and then uh, maybe answer some questions if anyone has any. Um, 
Here is elsewhere the saying is true that no undertaking can succeed without leaders, without managers. In parallelism with the corresponding phenomena in industrial and commercial life, it is evident that with the growth of working class organization, there must be an accompanying growth in the value, the importance, and the authority of the leaders. The principle of the division of labor creates specialism, and it is with good reason that the necessity for expert leadership has been compared with that which gives rise to specialism in the medical profession and in technical chemistry. Specialism, however, implies authority, just as the patient obeys the doctor because the doctor knows better than the patient. Having made a special study of the human body and health and disease, so must the political patient submit to the guidance of his party leaders, possess a political competence impossible of attainment by the rank and file. Thus, democracy ends by undergoing transformation into a form of government by the best, into an aristocracy. Just a quick aside, that is the literal um, etymology, the meaning of the word aristocracy. At once materially and morally, the leaders are those who must be regarded as the most capable and the most mature. Is it not, therefore, their duty as well as their right to put themselves at the head and to lead not merely as representatives of the party, but as individuals proudly conscious of their own personal value? So that's the end. I just went ahead and read through to the end there. Um, next time we'll get into part two, which is the autocratic tendencies of the leaders. And basically, part two, what he's going to discuss mostly, because um, we, so what we've talked about so far is mainly the, the practical realities that create these leaders. And then most of this time, the psychological reasons why people accept that um, and rationalize that and even um, transmute that into something religious um, and thus make the, and, and that all these um, aspects of even uh, aristocratic monarchy happen in party politics where you have these um, heritable lines of political power or um, the, the investment in the leader as, as a divine savior figure. And so there's the practical realities that create the need for leadership over the masses. There's the psychological realities within the masses and in the leaders that um, makes that attractive and um, allows for that to happen. So when we get into part two, um, he's mainly talking about the, the things that entrenched this reality and make the leaders of the party not just a you know bunch of professional experts, but a, a truly separate cast. They rigidify into a truly separate cast of people um, who are so different and so divergent from um, the, 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 the party rank and file that, um, I mean, it is really, I can't wait to get to the next chapter. Some of the things uh, I'll get into a little more examples that he brings up, um, that are, cause a couple of them are, are quite shocking. Um, I thought at least, but yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a tease, I guess. Um, okay. So we have, okay. Not really a question. Just some comments. People saying they're watching or are going to watch later. Um, okay, well, since we have like a minute, um, I will respond here to Theodore F. Weizenbaum Sr. Um, the reason why I like Thomas Hobbes, um, I think it's because he has the least um, idealistic conception of the social contract and... Um, what it represents and the most, uh, the most based account of where rights come from. Um, because ultimately, um, what I like in Hobbes is that everything is premised, um, in some sense on force. He, he, he is, he's recognizing the reality that this, the same reality that Nietzsche did or the legalists in the Han Chinese tradition did. Um, so that's that's what I like about Hobbes. I uh, I don't agree with him on everything, but I mean also um, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. I mean, what a great fucking phrase that he came up with for the state of nature. That like it he did, I mean I don't know. I like those particular collections of, of five words too because it's not um, um, like. Just the first thing, like solitary, of just being the that the the alienation that comes with living in a state of might makes right. 
and the the poverty of it and and like like yeah he does talk about the brutality but it's it's about the 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 poverty of not having a community of not having a state because the state is the what protects and preserves the community it's the state is the embodiment of the community's ability to use force um should be a public intellectual sometimes look at capitalism does to those of true ability what are you what he's trying to say man <laughs> my house isn't that bad it's not <laughs> i'm just in the i'm in the i'm in like the storage room basically is what it is um i hope you're not saying like look salt says that living in shambles he's living in absolute squalor <laughs> but yeah i mean it's it's uh they, that is what capitalism has done to Texas. Yes, there are reasons why that there are reason there are capitalist reasons why the power grid is down now um, and why everything is so fucked. And that's directly responsible for the water being down because the water is out because the water treatment plants lost power, which just happened because it was cold because it was too cold and we have nothing that's winterized for that level of and that was identified as the main vulnerability in our grid like back a decade ago and they did nothing about it um, because they're so obsessed with being completely separate from any sort of um, federal regulation or oversight. So when the federal regulators suggested that, which they don't actually have the power to tell them to do, um, they told them to go kick rocks. Um, that'll be too expensive, but I really wonder uh, probably going to be more expensive um, to clean up. I mean, there's like thousands of busted pipes, thousands and thousands. Um, all sorts of all sorts of problems. Sure, so maybe some are greater, perhaps in the position of Ben Shapiro. Uh, I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll make a action movie of my own. <laughs> I mean, Ben Shapiro is gonna, he's getting into directing. He's gonna have Gina Carano in his movies. That's my, that's my aspiration is to train. That's why I'm doing political vlogging is because I hope that one day I'll, I'll be able to transition that into directing movies about, um, school shootings, <laughs> do an action, do die hard in a school shooting. Um, I really am looking forward to more David daily wire pictures, David Hume. You know, I have not read really much David Hume. Uh, I have his inquiry concerning, um, oh my God, what is it called? Concerning human understanding. Or is it the principles of morals? See, I don't even remember what I fucking read by Hume. Um, I do remember reading his, uh, like finding his, some of his arguments on morality persuasive. Um, but I got, yeah, I, I don't know. I can't really, I can't really talk Hume. Um, I kind of have a, I, so I really was into the like English enlightenment figures, like the English liberals, you know, um, back in like high school and college. Um, and I still, to the extent that I am now, it's like, uh, um, his name Thomas Paine, um, especially agrarian justice, Hobbes. Um, God, who else? That's probably it. I, I actually, yeah, I, I, I think it's because I drifted so far from like, like I used to be really into Locke when I was uh, like really libertarian, and that, um, uh, and I don't know that the. I guess I just drifted so far from that conception of, of morality and, and politics and everything that it, it became really hard to, uh, to, to appreciate it in the same way. I know Hume isn't technically English. He's British, but I, 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 I loop him in with like the English enlightenment uh, figures, um, especially because he's such a important force in like secularism in philosophy. Uh, 
Friedrich says, I look ironically like a younger Thomas Hobbes. Okay. Maybe I should, the next, the next uh, still image for the next stream will have to be a picture of Thomas Hobbes. It'll really confuse people. Um, because I won't talk about Thomas Hobbes at all. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, he was Scottish. He was Scottish. Okay. Well, uh, I think I'm going to wrap it up here. And then, uh, but, you know, I'll do another one of these soon. Maybe I'll schedule one where it'll be easier to get more people in the room. But again, I'm just kind of, uh, I'm just kind of, I've been slogging through this Michelle's book for so long now. Um, and I keep like reading and rereading it. And I finally like started to make like, marginal notes and it's like my annotated copy now, which I don't normally do. I used to be very much against that. Um, Cause I hated when I would go to a used bookstore and pick up a philosophy book. Um, it's like, Oh, this is exactly the edition I want. It's a great price. And somebody has written all over it. But um, I'm not planning on ever selling this book. Um, I And I'm thinking as I do a deep dive into it and annotate it for all the parts I need, I'm probably never going to like fully read this again because Michel's is not fun to read. Um, I, I thought he would be. I like some of the stories. They're very interesting, but um, he's not, he doesn't have the, um, I don't know, his style is very... Uh, very just sort of tedious at times. Um, but uh, this is making it a lot easier because um, I'm able to like, talk out my thoughts on it. And like, I would never do a book club on this because I know no one's going to like fall through in this because it's, it's not, it's not enjoyable to read. Uh, and um, I've got a comp book from Cambridge University Press that was annotated. Hell. Yeah. Well, and, and see, that's the thing too, is, is part of why it's annoying is if you do want to do it yourself, um, it makes it basically impossible. And like a book like Kant, you have to take notes on to really, uh, like if you, it's like critique of pure, pure reason or something. Um, yeah, very, very tough, very tough stuff. But yeah, I'm not planning on ever selling this book. I'm probably never going to like read it all again in one sitting. And uh, so fuck it, you know, it's not going to ever be in a, in a used bookstore for someone else to get annoyed over. And if they do, fuck them. It's my book. So I had a complete turnaround. I used to be, feel very strongly not marking out my own books. I'm still not going to do that for certain books that I are really important to me. But um, yeah. All right. So I was going to wrap it up two minutes ago. Here, I'm still talking. So ending the stream by... Thanks, Emerald, and whoever else, at least one other person, one or two other people saw this.